Maybe if I hold him better. What is a prologue? <laughs> Tell me how to hold you. <gasps> You're purring. So for, so first off, what is a, I wonder if you don't like being picked up on camera because I yell in your ear. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another video. Today we are talking about a topic that I honestly thought I covered and I went looking for the video and I couldn't find it. So prologues have a pretty bad rap. Rap? Rap? I literally don't know which one it is. But why do we hate prologues so much? Is it with good reason? Is it with bad reason? What are the other options here? There are no other options. So the topics I'm gonna cover in this video include what is a prologue, benefits of a prologue, types of prologues, did I have to put prologue after every single one of these? Opinions on prologues, prologue sins, yeah, you notice how I put that right almost at the end of the video, all sneaky like. There's also timestamps in the description down below, so if you wanna just skip to prologue sins, you can, but the rest of this video is interesting too. And then last but not least, I'm gonna cover how to write a prologue and then just briefly touch on some things I haven't touched on in the rest of the video. Oh, the fur is landing on my face from the air and tickling me. A prologue is an opening to a story which gives context and establishes background that can help people better understand and appreciate the main story. Generally, there's at least one form of separation between the prologue and the main story. Things like a different POV character, a large period of time, anywhere from years to centuries, that sort of thing, where if it was included in the main narrative, it would break immersion and trip readers up. This separation can often be furthered by switching up the POV, changing tenses, or even changing the format and style of the writing itself. So what are the benefits of a prologue? The first one is that a prologue is a good way to provide context or show a scene that would otherwise be out of place in the main narrative. Because the audience knows what a prologue is, they know that they can't expect anything present in the prologue to continue on to chapter one, which means there's not gonna be an immersion break if that character is gone or there's a big time hop. The second use of prologues is to make promises about what's to come in the story. Now, this should not be used as a bandage to correct for a slow start to the book, but rather for stories where certain aspects of them are gonna lead readers to have certain expectations. This can also be done to make promises to try to get readers through a portion of the story that doesn't necessarily match the premise. So an example of this would be The Greatest Showman, where the prologue shows the character in a circus to remind you that that's what's eventually gonna happen, and then they go on to show the character growing up. Now this could be a good example or a bad example. I don't actually know. I didn't watch it. Josh watched it. I hate musicals. I just can't get over the logistics of how all of the characters somehow know the lyrics and the choreography and I can't handle it. And benefit number three, prologues can serve as a warning sign to scare away readers before they purchase, which can help prevent DNFs and as a result, negative reviews. So to do this, the prologue throws the reader or the audience straight into the deeper, hits of the story to see if they can handle it. This is full of traps that could potentially lead to a bad prologue, but if done well, it can serve its purpose. A good example of this, I think, is the prologue to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The last ever dolphin message was misinterpreted as a surprisingly sophisticated attempt to do a double backward somersault through a hoop while whistling the Star Spangled Banner. But in fact, the message was this. So long, and thanks for all the fish. I have fur in my mouth. There's fur in the air. How much cat fur do you think is in my lungs? Probably a lot, right? Humans can't cough up fur balls. That seems like a evolutionary mistake right there. Next up, types of prologues. Now in this video I'm covering the more standard prologue and by that I mean scenes and info dumped history that should be formatted as scenes. So I'm not gonna be covering the other type of pre-chapter one content like quotes, poems, documents, files, like definitions here on the side, things that are very much stylistic. Those have a whole set of guidelines on their own that I would have to cover in a whole other video. So if you're interested in that, you can drop a like, leave a comment. So the types of scene-based prologues fall into the following categories. Pre-title prologues. 
Now this is a super short kind of cinematic prologue that gives us a feeling of the theme of the story and a tiny little peek at the overall hook of the story, but it only skims the surface. Because of the low amounts of essential information provided in this type of prologue, they do have to be kept short and very interesting. Disney is a really big fan of this type of prologue. Actually, Disney is just a fan of prologues in general. They like prologues so much that they took a wrinkle in time, which didn't have a prologue, and they just smashed one into it. Some good examples of this are Raven Boys and Scorpio Races by Maggie Steve. The next type is called Bookend, and this is where a prologue pulls an equivalent of Once Upon a Time. This is where we start off a story way in the future after the story has finished. A book? That's right. When I was your age, television was called books. Settle down, Jacquesheet, and I will tell you a tale. Ah! Ah! Look at all this fur. I could go get it a lit roller. But am I gonna? Oh my god! Look at this. Look at, you see these holes? Do you know what those holes are from? Cat claws. I can't have nice things. I look like I got mauled. <laughs> Next up, we have the villain POV. This prologue is really great for if you want to make the promise to the reader that there is gonna be a villain eventually, but the villain isn't even known to anyone until much later in the story. I think an example of this done correctly would be, <laughs> I got it. Whoa, that was a close one. That's okay, I actually have two copies of these since I don't know what books I own. Here, we're not only given a scene of importance that's full of mystery and has a hook, but we're also shown that Voldemort is gonna be making an appearance at some point in the novel. And this is especially important for the fourth book because the third book had a unique lack of Voldemort. The next type is flashback or the character's ghost. Character's ghost is just movie speak for an event that happened in the character's past which haunts them or follows them around. In stories where the main plot or the main character are almost entirely influenced by an event that happened in the past, this is a good type of prologue to use because it allows the readers to experience that event directly. This should only be done when the event is pivotal to the character's core or the core of the plot. A really good example of this done very well is Skyward by Brandon, S Brandon Sanderson. They're really bad at names. This prologue had its own hook and the event was also at the core of not just the overall plot of the book, but also of a lot of our characters' behavior and motivations. And last but not least, we have teasers. And these are scenes pulled straight out of the climax or an important scene later on, and they're used solely to pique the interest of the reader. Though how acceptable this is varies a lot from genre to genre, it's generally viewed as cheating. An example of this is Twilight. It basically says that at some point, this story will have a villain. It will have action besides just, you know, that sparkly vampire action. Let's talk about opinions on prologues. So first off, why do writers hate prologues? Because a good prologue is essentially a second first chapter. Writing the first chapter is torture. Writing the first chapter twice is double that torture. Why would we want to do that to ourselves? Do readers skip prologues? How many times have we been told that readers are going to skip the prologue? It's a lot of times. Well, what if I told you that everything we know about you guys is wrong? I have some data for you, and it is super scientific data. I don't know why scientists keep refusing to peer review my papers, but I ran a Twitter poll and it showed that 82% of people don't skip the prologue. 14% of people either sometimes skip the prologue or else were very confused. And only 4% of the people polled felt that prologues were unimportant. Don't trust my super scientific data? Well, Epic Reads also ran a poll back in 2013, and their poll showed that around 84% of people read the prologue and only about 2% of people skipped the prologue. But you should base your beliefs off of my data because they only polled 208 people and I polled over 300 people. I feel like that whole section had way too many occurrences of the word poll. How many polls could a poll cat poll if a poll cat could poll polls? Alexa, what's a poll cat? A noun poll cat is usually defined as a European mammal. Poll cats aren't actual cats. I feel betrayed. They're kind of cute. I'll forgive them. Are poll cats ferrets? So many lies. I don't know what to believe anymore. 
Also, I have a bachelor's degree in biology, which means that I can say with utmost certainty that this is incredibly biased data because most of the followers of my platform on Twitter and most of the followers of Epic Reads are hardcore readers or at least people who read frequently. And then we have to ask ourselves, do we actually care about people who read one book a year or less? No, we don't. Okay, so let's still go off of my data because it's more recent and because you like me. So what about that 4% of people that said that they skipped the prologue? Why do they commit such a treasonous act? Well, that's an easy answer. It's generally just because they've been exposed to too many bad prologues. Why do publishers and agents hate prologues? The short answer is they don't. So I read a few posts by actual agents telling authors to cut out the prologue, and it seems that one of the main reasons is just that authors tend to use prologues as duct tape to cover up bigger issues in their novel, and with the absence of duct tape, they have to implement actual fixes. That's a lot of damage. And now, we've gotten to the fun part, prologue sins. First up, we have using the prologue as an excuse to cheap out on the first chapter. The example of this that I have, it's gonna hit you right in the childhoods, Aragon by Christopher Paolini. I have respect for this author because he wrote this when he was really young, but the prologue is unnecessary and the first chapter is only like two pages and doesn't have a hook. And the first few chapters overall are kind of boring. Next up, prologues that spend too much time developing characters and things that we never see again. Now this doesn't apply to important characters. Skyward has the prologue where they develop the father character, but it's okay because that relationship between the father and Spensa is really important to her character development. Next, Sin. The prologue is just an info dump. If I pick up a book that has this type of prologue, I will either skip the prologue or put down the book. I just realized since you can't see Khajiit sitting on the stool in front of me, this just looks really awkward. Like, what am I doing with my hands? <laughs> There's a cat here, I swear. The next one is actually a pet peeve of mine that was one of the types of prologues, and that is teasers. I feel personally like it is completely cheating to just grab an exciting scene from the end of the book, slap it in the front of the book, and using that to try to hook the reader. I'm reading the book, I want to get to that scene with all of the proper building blocks that are going to be put in place throughout the book. I don't want to have spoilers by reading that scene early. Unnecessary prologues. And for some reason, these are always the prologues that are also unnecessarily long. And last but not least, we have what I think is the greatest prologue sin, one that is oddly enough used in a book I really like, and that is calling your prologue chapter one. A reader knows what a prologue is, and they're trained to have certain expectations about prologues. And yes, some of them are gonna skip it, but they don't matter. With prologues, we as the reader know that there's gonna be a disconnect between the prologue and chapter one. Whereas if you just put chapter one right next to chapter two and the first one's a prologue, there's gonna be a big immersion break when you jump from one to the other. Harry Potter kind of escaped this because the kid's name is on the book. Did I just call Harry Potter a kid? Is that how old I am now? Oh no, this is not okay. That's how you know you're old. You know, it's at the point where you start watching movies like Little Mermaid and you start relating to the parents. Run away with you? <laughs> well, of course they didn't want her to grow legs and go gallivanting around with all the humans. And Harry Potter is a kid. I'm sorry, I'm just having an existential crisis over here. Don't, don't listen to me. I was the wrong thing to say on a video where you listening to me is the whole purpose. I don't even remember where I was. Because Harry Potter's name is on the book and the book has a young kid, we can assume that the baby in the first chapter, being Harry, is gonna grow up. So it wasn't as jarring as it could have been. However, I see the advice all over the place that if you don't want people to skip the prologue, just slap a first chapter tag on it. There are some prologues where that is gonna cause a huge amount of broken immersion and confusion. Now on to how to write a prologue. Now some of the information you need to know was obviously included in the first part of this video, but there are a couple things that I missed so I'm gonna cover those now. First up, we have length. When writing a prologue, you should try to keep it shorter than your average chapter length. Prologues are more likely to fatigue the reader because they know that most, if not all, of the components in the prologue are gonna disappear as soon as they hit chapter one. Tip number two, 
make it necessary. So I've read a couple blog posts and seen a video or two and luckily this isn't the majority but there are a couple authors out there giving a bit of advice that because readers so frequently skip prologues, you shouldn't put in any essential information that you wouldn't want them to skip. Now, I don't blame the authors who say this, but it's flawed. And funny enough, this tomato of advice is slapped right onto the white bread tip of make your prologue necessary. No, I don't understand the bread and tomato analogy. It made sense in my head. But anyways, you see the issue here, right? These are completely conflicting pieces of advice. So these two tips lead us straight to the meat of the issue, and I don't know why everything is a sandwich analogy. I must be getting hungry. So you have two options. Make the prologue essential, knowing that some readers will skip it and lose essential information, or make the prologue interesting but skippable. A lot of writers given these two options will lean towards the latter, but this is just worsening the problem. Imagine you walk into your first day of class at a university. You sit down, you notice that half of the chairs around you are empty. The professor acknowledges this and says, Lots of students skip the first day. I account for this and never cover anything essential until day two. How many of those students are then gonna walk out of that class, skip the entire rest of their first day, go back to their dorm, sit down, play Elder Scrolls online, because that's what they would really rather be doing at this exact second. Random example, Psh, I don't play Elder Scrolls. I don't, what even is Elder Scrolls? Cause you stopped meowing back there. Traitor, I'll cut you. So yeah, if you include essential things in your prologue, some people are gonna skip it. But who would you rather punish? The people who thought that your prologue was worth their time or the people who skipped it? You don't have to be the professor that drops a quiz on your students the first day, but you should at least be that one professor that throws meat at your students the first day. If you don't, you're just furthering the cycle. And if you're still worried about people skipping, just put all of the meat that you want in chapter one and in the other chapters and skip the prologue entirely. Next tip. Your prologue needs a hook. Good prologues often cover a novel-wide hook or question. This will also help kind of establish the theme of the story. But keep in mind, this doesn't get you out of the first chapter hook. So to avoid being repetitive, a lot of books have a first chapter hook that is an immediate threat, but is mostly only going to affect the main character, whereas the hook in the prologue is a much wider threat threatening the world or at least a large group of people, but is much less immediate, especially since that hook isn't going to really become relevant until probably closer to the climax of your story. So this sort of balances out the weight of the hook so neither one trods on the feet of the other. I think Tim over at Hello Future Me did a really good job covering this, so I'm going to go ahead and link his video in the description down below. He also has a book now called On Writing and World Building. And the first chapter covers prologue, so I'll also link this in the description down below. Next up we have characters. Unless it's like one page short, then you'll need a character to keep things grounded. And that's gonna mean a tiny bit of character description or character development. However, you should focus on developing relevant characters, or you can just kind of glaze over a lot of the character development stuff, but you don't want your reader to feel like they really got to know this character and then have that character not matter or be mentioned for the entire rest of the story. And last but not least, piece of advice, treat your prologue like your first chapter, because it basically is one. Which means watch the video coming out next week or the week after because I'm going to be covering everything about first chapters. Hit that bell so you can get notified. Notified. Don't get notified, please. Hit that bell so you can get notified as soon as that new video goes live. As always, remember that I don't know your story, so I can't tell you what works and what doesn't work. Anytime I make a video, remember th more what you call guidelines than actual rules. You should get beta readers, if you can, critique partners, and Josh, because Josh will also tell you if your prologue works or doesn't work. Go become a patron. And that was it for this video. If you found this helpful or funny or enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like. That lets me know if you guys are enjoying things. If you like dark dystopian novels that defy the cliches of the genre, Alethea is available in hardcover, paperback, and ebook. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video.